Welcome to the Business of Race podcast, where we examine issues of race and racism, how they impact businesses, and what organizations can do to effectively address these issues to create a healthier work environment for everyone. I'm your host, Regina Newkirk Rucci, Director of Equity at 90 Forward. And today, I am joined in the conference room. This is like family for me. Um, well, you know, well, in truth, Lauren is family. <gasps> yes, uh, that's Lauren true. is the director of Dell Development for Nido Forward and um, just sort of my co-conspirator in things uh, in the organization. And then we have the great and mighty Tina Worth who is a consultant and knower of all things <laughs> and repeat guest on the Business of Race podcast. Welcome to the conference room, ladies. Thanks, family. Happy to join you. Thanks for having us. All right. So before we get into it, we just chit chat for a minute. And I know I liked, I really like gift giving is probably my number one love language. I love getting the right gifts for people. Uh, but my pocketbook does not. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I think you can get some meaningful gifts for people and not spend a ton of money. So if you were thinking about, like, I just want to give a gift to brighten someone's day or let them know that I was thinking of them or, you know, you're special to me. What are some things that maybe you wouldn't necessarily think of, but are really good gifts for under $20. So for instance, I know I had a friend of mine gave me light bulbs and I was like, okay, this is fantastic. Cause I need I light bulbs, that. right? <laughs> They're not expensive, but I was like, everybody uses them. And uh, they were the energy efficient ones. She's like, so change out all that old stuff you got in your house. I know you don't. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I was like, I would never think to give somebody light bulbs. It was a really great gift. So what are some fun or unusual gifts that you might think about first of all you know you can tell the age of somebody by whether or not they have led or incandescent bulbs i mean mm-hmm. you could walk into someone's home and it, it's been a lot to get me to transfer over i'm not like, going to say you anything try, further to related say to my age I'm, I'm an old person because i still have a few I, i'm saying marketers may not be approaching us as a key demographic <laughs> at this stage <laughs> uh, you know it's okay it's okay but yeah oh God, i love gift giving and i used to hate it um, because I always thought that it had to be in the un- over $20 range. My experience has been that if someone feels heard as a result of your gift, it's a great gift. Mm-hmm. So light bulbs. So you, clearly you spoke to someone about practicality. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, <laughs> One that I've been giving out lately has been um, toilet bowl uh, light, light up toilet bowl things. Um, what, what? Yeah. what are light up toilet bowl mm-hmm. things? <laughs> So it's like a, a light. I'm really hoping some of the listeners are, are nodding emphatically to, to, <laughs> with knowledge um, or quizzically. At, uh, but but it's, a, it's basically a little thing you hang on your light bowl, on, on your toilet bowl, and it lights up the bowl. Now, this was given as a gag gift, but it was given as a gag gift to my parents who are getting on in years. Mm-hmm. They love it as a night light that doesn't cause that night vision blindness. Mm-hmm. It is three dollars and fifty cents from Timu. <laughs> it's your insider tip for the day, and it's actually I've given it out more and more. It's fun. It's novel. It's actually a safety thing. So, yeah, and actually, kind of, I would see that like you get up in the middle of the night. That could be kind of handy. I'm not yes. admitting that I got one of those from my dad once. <laughs> you, is it still I, in your toilet? So it's not. It did die pretty quickly, but I did like it. It was color changing. It would so, cycle through the colors. I hear you saying you liked having a toilet bowl light-up thing, I, and you are in need of one. Yeah. I'm just noting. See? <laughs> and there's a gift-giving opportunity right yeah. there. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Do you have a favorite? Um, I. It's funny you said light bulbs, because I like to give practical things or consumable things. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I think we all have too much stuff, for mm-hmm. the most part. But the one thing that I would say that I absolutely love to give and get is blankets. Mm, little fun little really? small blankets. Because they're so cozy and wonderful, and you can never have enough. Blankets used to be more expensive than they are today. Yeah, yeah. Don't you feel like? Yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. like really fancy, nice ones are still yeah. expensive. But you yeah. can get like a really fun, fun and I, There's nothing like a really, really yeah. soft blanket. Exactly. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's almost like with the ease, and that's what I feel like about the thoughtfulness and, and like a preference. Because Amazon makes it really easy to get the things, mm-hmm. but I think that it's the personal touch that still matters. Yeah. And honestly, the thing that still always lands the best to me costs nothing, and that's a handwritten thank you note from someone. Yes. I love those. Or just, I'm thinking about you. Yeah, and you know, I find that people always, they tell me like they know it's from me because they got it in snail mail and it was handwritten. <laughs> I was like, but it stands out. It does. Right? And so it, I think it takes a minute to, um, you know, write you a note, but people do appreciate it when you do. I've also now, though, I'm having to recognize I'm starting, we're starting to have that transfer of people who don't read cursive. Oh, yeah. So now my younger folks, I'm having to print notes, which actually takes much, much longer. But I do have to keep that in mind with the handwritten notes. I know, right? Is cursive going the way of Latin? Yes. Oh, Exploribum unum. Yes. Sorry, I don't really know what that means, but I just thought I would exclaim yeah. in Latin. Yeah. It's well, hard to exclaim in cursive. You know, just <laughs> grab things off of coins and sure, that applies right now. <laughs> All right. Well, so let's get into our agenda after we've uh, had this fun with the gift giving. <laughs> All right, and now we have to go look at toilet, light up toilet bowl lights. But um, as we are in this space, 90 Forward, we do racial equity and justice work, right? Which in the state of Florida um, mm-hmm. presents additional challenges and the work itself can be emotionally taxing, difficult. We can run into some hard truths, challenging issues, not having everybody come together and be like, yay, this is great. It's wonderful, right? There are other organizations who do this kind of work or similar work where it's very challenging, taxing. Maybe it's not the topic of the day or even there are political campaigns or community campaigns going against it. For corporations, it's really easy to take the easy road right so it's very easy to anything with children and puppies right the easy funding right if i tell you i'm going to feed some children i'm going to find a home for this cute little adorable dog nobody's upset but why should corporations support organizations that are a little bit more difficult why should they run the risk of getting into what could be maybe seen as controversial or uh, a little sticky? You all could be and wind up in the news. Why should this be an area of funding for corporations? The first thing I'm hit with when uh, you're posing this question is – Everybody crowding into the space in June of 2020. All this corporate response. And when emotions run high, when veils are lifted, there's something that feels easy in that moment. And I think the same could be held true for corporate America. I mean, I think that it's easy, right? Or, hey, I'm going to change my profile picture to this. That's the corporate equivalent of we're making a statement. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's when it's hard that it's actual work. I mean, I don't know if there's a metric for this, and I'm sure there's a more learned scholar on this, but I feel like an organization, a corporation that's trying to engage in equity work, if it's not difficult, then they're not actually having a real conversation. If some people are not upset, it means that the status quo is still holding. Now, there's a very real question that comes to the forefront, which is, do corporations have a place in making a statement or getting involved in things that are considered political. Uh In Florida, right now, anything involving diversity, equity, and inclusion is considered political. Some other people might consider it basic human rights. So in Florida, there's a fine dance that everyone's having to walk, and I think that corporations are ever fearful of losing customers, and right now it's a tenuous walk for them to make. So your question was, why do corporations, why should they engage? Well, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing for the emerging workforce. People in power struggle when they're going to lose power and whether that's the majority or management or whatever that looks like. But if it's tough work, it's the right work. So corporations need to be in the space. They just need to be in it thoughtfully. 
don't say you're going to be there if you're not going to be there. I think that's actually worse. Well, I think this gets back to a lot of what happened um, with George Floyd's murder, right? Everybody sort of jump on this bandwagon of we're going to do, we're going to do, we we're against, we support. We didn't really think about it. We put out a statement. But then employees are like, didn't you say you were going to do something? Didn't you commit this? And we're not seeing anything. And so that thoughtful piece is really important. But I think it also is an opportunity to align with your values. So, for instance, I disagree. I think most things are political. I think you can't avoid being political. I think you can avoid being partisan. Hmm. Right. Okay. But if you're going to be meaningfully engaging in the communities where you live, you have to be political. Things matter because they matter to your employees. They matter to your business. And, And I also would argue that corporations are political all the time, especially for things pertaining to the business. Right. (laughs) If yes. there's a if there's a bill coming that's going to impact the amount I'm paying in taxes, you better believe we're political. So I don't think trying to avoid being political, even truthfully, is possible, but I also don't think it makes sense. I think you can avoid being partisan, but I think you can do that by adhering to your values. And then if it aligns with your values, then maybe that's that's your case that's why you're doing it and it shows your consistency for who you are as an organization i don't disagree with that i, I think that's a point well taken uh, i but i do think that corporations need to understand the business proposition for getting engaged in the first place if it's just feel good only then i don't know that the will or the resolve from a board of directors or from the C-suite leadership will continue to be there unless there's a business case behind it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, point well received. Well, and that's what to me is the wildest part is the business case. So obviously for some of us in this work, it's, it's heart work. We care about it. It's a human rights thing. But the business, do you want the highest and best employees? Do you want the broadest customer base? This It's basic. It's wild to me that people shy away from this work because you're really limiting. You talk about, you know, making certain customers go away. How many customers are you losing by not being in the work? So if you, if you don't, you know, connect with the work from an emotional standpoint, how are you not connecting with the, with the bottom line? Billions of dollars are lost. There are studies about it because of inequity. Mm-hmm. So it's just wild to me that we, we don't see that more. But I think that also gets to how we talk about it, right? Because we talk about the customers we will lose as opposed to the customers we never connected with in the first place, right? And how this group of people will feel about an issue, but we weren't thinking about how this group of people will feel about an issue. So how we manage that conversation I think is also steered by who we're talking about when we have it. Right? But I also think it isn't business cases that are made. People are saying, oh, I do this because it's the right thing to do. Emotions are really high about this at the moment. It's topical. That's the way the wind is blowing. And so then the wind stops blowing that way. Then you leave it, which I think is really a struggle for organizations Like, oh, there's lots of funding now because people are talking about it. And then they're not. So then we're going to pull the funding and it makes it harder to do the work. So how do you manage that from corporates? Or let me let me ask it this way. How do you think corporations should plan their giving, particularly for organizations doing difficult work? Um, Is this a year we just give it to you this year and then we'll see how the wind blows next year? certainly can be topical, but, or should this be particularly for this kind of work, more of a long-term plan because the work itself is long-term? What are your thoughts about that? That's such an interesting question. (laughs) Um, It goes back to the corporate values, I think. Uh, If you really have those corporate values, then obviously put your money behind them. That's one of the ways that you can make a difference. Um, So I think to me, that's really important. Um, I think it's also on the nonprofits and the folks doing the work to really diversify 
who they're asking, how they're asking. Because if you expect a company to give you that money to support this work and then the wind changes and then you're without that funding, you know, that you have to be prepared for that, especially in Florida, especially these days. Yeah, I was with an organization and they had half of their funding from one source. Terrifying. And then the foundation changed their priorities. It happens. Right? It, it happens. happens. Yeah. And if it left the organization in an extraordinarily vulnerable state. And so I agree with that. I think that you have to, uh, from the nonprofit side, be thinking about diverse funding sources and opportunities. But I do think from the corporate side, you also have to think about if you're funding work, how long is the work going to take for you to see the kind of results you want to see? And then how long could you commit to doing it as opposed to, yeah, we'll just fund it this year. Well, here's what I think. There's a there's an infrastructure question that you posed there. You know, the question that the, the, this discussion went from how do you do something in house to how do you stay the course in supporting an external organization with your philanthropic dollars? Mm-hmm. Well, you know what I'd be doing right now, directors of development <laughs> out there, I'd be making the case that in fact, no, you may not be equipped as an organization to have the tough conversations. You can outsource some of that. I think a wonderful case in point, honestly, y'all, I'm not being paid for this, but the 904 race cards. Yeah. You know, for, for those for those who are really familiar with the work, it doesn't feel particularly groundbreaking when you've had, you know, if you're in your 10th or 20th conversation. Mm-hmm. For the people that have been on the employee side of things, I didn't know that about my coworker. Oh my gosh, this is fascinating. We would never be able to broach topics like this. There is a safety in asking an expert to come in and handle sensitive content and topics. Mm-hmm. So what would be interesting, I think that tr- I think what a nonprofit organization can offer a corporation is the infrastructure to stay the course. This is our day in day out business. This mm-hmm. is what we do. We are about helping people, whether it's through race equity or social services or whatever the case is. So we can stay the course in a way that you may not be able to. We have the infrastructure to do it. And that's the message I'd carry forward. The other thing then in the state of Florida that corporations are owed, and this is the part that's a little bitter pill to swallow, you have to make them feel safe to do so. Mm -hmm. And the question is one that really becomes one about your internal barometer for how much you're willing to stuff down to take the corporate dollars. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it could be um, benign. Mm -hmm. Other times it can be detrimental to what you have to agree to say and not say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also lines that organizations have to decide for themselves. Um, Lauren and I have had quite a few conversations. You can't afford to let the dollars make the decisions for you. You have to make the decisions before the dollars even come up. And that's hard. That is Preach. hard. And that is hard. Oh, it's, and I can see in your faces, yes, yeah, by the hard. way, that it's you've had some it's very hard. real conversations around that. Yeah. We've been, in, we've been in agreement on this. I want to be. I want to be clear <laughs> yeah. about that. Yeah, but yeah. you know, but it can hurt though. It I can. Just saying no to dollars yeah. for a nonprofit organization is difficult. Saying no mm-hmm. to dollars can be really hard mm-hmm. um, because you know that you have paychecks sitting behind those dollars. You have people. Mm-hmm. You have families. Uh, you have programming, of course, um, and so it can be really hard. But it's super critical because you can't get caught up in it. Mm-hmm. Because you wind up in a a tail wagging the dog situation. Mm -hmm. And then you as an organization can wind up losing credibility because you are compromising who you are in order to secure a check. And again, I get it. I was at an organization that had to turn down $7 million. Oh, that hurts. (laughs) That hurts. Yeah. Right. But you want to give it to us with all of these stipulations we cannot provide, we can't agree to, we can't make sure. Because at the end of the day, and I think this is also something that's really important, at the end of the day, you should feel good about giving the gift and we should feel good about receiving it. That's right. And if both of those are not going to be true, it's not worth it. And that's Really hard. When too expensive. Sometimes too expensive. money is too expensive mm-hmm. to receive. Mm-hmm. And that can be very difficult. I mean, just, you know, from a pure operational grant standpoint, but from from a can I sleep? 
can can I comfortably sleep at night? Uh, am I going off on mission creep? Am I chasing dollars? Am I selling my soul for this? I think that's you know it's interesting. There's sometimes this disconnect between right now frontline workers and mm-hmm. management in mm-hmm. a lot of organizations, mm-hmm. right? How come you aren't being more strident? It's like because I, I, you have to wrestle with revenue and principle and purpose, and those aren't easy things. But again, if it's difficult, then you're probably doing something right because you're being thoughtful. Mm-hmm. Well, and and I think this is a, an interesting bridge too because you're in the nonprofit space. You work with a lot of nonprofits. I don't think that most times corporations intend to be difficult with constraints or requirements with giving, right? And I don't know that there's a real understanding of sometimes the constraints that are put in place that they are actually constraining. And so with this platform, what are some things that you would encourage corporations to do or not do with their funding. So uh, one of the things that I think about is um, give, give it all to nine oh forward. Yes, yes. <laughs> do that. Definitely do that. But um, I think about Mackenzie Scott, who has been giving out um, a lot of dollars. But one of the things that she said was she didn't want people to have to take away from the work to do these really arduous applications or reports on what they were doing. Right. I want you to actually do the work, not spend all of your time applying for money or telling me what you did with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so and I thought, wow, that's really thoughtful because I don't know that people realize how much work can go into filling out a grant report, um, Mm -hmm. particularly if it's government dollars um, or a grant application. Right. So what are some things that you really wish corporations knew or they would consider if they're going to be working with nonprofits, particularly those that have sort of these challenging um, missions that require a lot more energy at work. I just have one example that comes to mind of a client I worked with on the, um, the giving side towards a nonprofit. Um, The nonprofits affiliated in the LGBTQ space. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a very dangerous space right now, particularly as it relates to trans youth care. Uh, but but that the the corporation didn't have the tools to be able to work with their internal audiences to articulate that the funding was for a particular aspect of the work. I think sometimes when work gets controversial, people want to make just like they want to do it with groups. You want to create a monolith, right? Mm-hmm. There's one thing this organization does. Mm-hmm. I, I, let me provide the, an inflammatory example I can think of right now in the safety of this podcast. If you give a dollar to Planned Parenthood, mm-hmm. are you funding abortions? Mm-hmm. No, you might actually just be funding somebody getting a mammogram. Right. And that's basic healthcare. So you could, so I think that it's to organizations too to help corporations walk to higher and safer ground if that serves them on messaging and things like that. Again, it's to the extent that you're comfortable. But if it's about the mental health of young people who may be identifying as gay or as transgender, I don't think most of America would say, "Mm, no, I don't care about that person's mental health. They Mm -hmm. may differ on how to treat the physicality of that individual, Mm -hmm. but everyone can support the mental health. So in that instance, I'd say, well, then make it very clearly to fund mental health work. Um, you know, a lot of corporate spaces would talk about the fact that, hey, let's lift up, you know, potential leaders of color. All right. That's probably safer work than talking specifically about equity, self-expression, uh, you know, uh, the majority rules, culture setting, some of those kind of things. Okay. You got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. So if it means that you're going to be in this particular space, then Start there. Mm-hmm. You know, I would counsel any any it, it, to remove funding, Lauren, as you indicated. Like it, it's it can be just devastating to take away that funding. And so, um, so is there a middle ground? Is there a safer, higher ground that you and a corporate partner can sit at temporarily while the seas are s- stormy, and then you get back out of port when things kind of pass over? So for me, I recognize that most companies essentially need to show what they're doing with that money. 
So I understand some of why they have the applications and the questions. Um, we've seen a, a little bit of a trend towards making more common applications because if I can answer a couple questions that are very, fairly similar across three or four grants, then maybe that helps me. Um, but to me, it kind of builds on what you were saying. The multi-year trust-based giving is what more nonprofits need. Mm -hmm. And that takes more time than sometimes just applying. Like I need you to maybe be on this journey with me for a little while. I need to meet with you. I need to meet with your leadership. I really need to understand what you do and what your goals are. But I also need you to understand, to your point, my work. And, you know, maybe A is what people see in the news most or see, you know, on the website more. But we also do B, C, and D. And so let's, you learn about me. I'll learn, it's like dating. Um, get to know <laughs> me a little bit. Yeah. I'm not asking you to marry me on the first date. I'm not mm -hmm. asking for a million dollars right out of the gate. Um, I need you to kind of know what my work is. And it also, you know, and it's, it's what 904 does. It's building trust. It's, it's yes. learning about each other, building trust to that, you know, that I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try my hardest and that you're coming to this partnership with your best effort and your best faith in what we're doing. So to me, it's it's kind of, sometimes it takes a little bit more time to get there. For some folks, it doesn't. Uh -huh. um, shout out Yield Giving, love them. Um, but I think for, for some folks, it does take a little bit more time. And so it's patience. And that's an internal conversation with a nonprofit too, because you know certainly leadership, often you have a budget that you need to make. And so it's hard yeah. to think about, well, I'm not going to ask this person for a year or two years mm -hmm. or more maybe. Mm -hmm. But when I do ask, we're going to have those multi-year gifts. Right. And I think to me, a multi-year gift is really the most impactful. Operating gifts, yes. multi-year gifts. Because if I can count on it for a couple of years and you can, I can give you, I can show you what I can do with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't, I'm not constantly churning through year after year, you know, all these grants. The other part of it is really recognizing, so 904 is fortunate. We have a me. Um, I've been doing this for a number of years. We won't say how many. Um, I know how it works. I know how the game is played um, for the most part. And so what about those smaller organizations or those organizations uh, with folks who don't look like me that don't know how the game is played, that don't, when they walk in the room, you know, they're not a white lady with a bob. Um, they're already at a disadvantage. We know that. And so I think it's it's there's a lot that I'd love to see change, um, but at the same time, kind of recognizing that it is a two way street, and I can't just have everybody give me all the unrestricted dollars. They, I have to be able to work with them. So it's 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 the long game. Well, and I hear a couple of different things there, right? And a lot of it being internal conversations on both sides, and then conversations with each other. Because I think you have to have some for the organization. I think you have to talk about what it is you're wanting to fund. I really, really encourage them to align with values that because that allows you to sort of keep the funding, keep the course and go back to why you're doing it very clear and let your employees know again. So we're being authentic. It goes through everything that we do. I think on the nonprofit side, we have to have real conversations about what we are and are not willing to do. And you have to have those lines before the money opportunities in front of you so that doesn't make the decision for you. I think you also have to talk about you have to have a plan for relationship building. You may not be fortunate to have a development person, but you have to have somebody. And if that is a board member, if that's a volunteer, if that's the CEO, somebody has to have devoted time to building relationships and getting the message out to funders because you have to build trust. And then I think that conversation is, what is it that you really want? And what is it that we do that could help you align? Because sometimes, again, you have to be willing to walk away from funding because it's not a good match. If you really, really, really care about the environment, we're probably not going to be the match for you. There are lots, so many or good organizations who are doing that. And let me help point you in the way those who are doing it, maybe in an equitable fashion. But you can't force it and expect it to be good money and a good relationship in corporations as well, right? This doesn't really align with who we are and what we're doing. I want to support them, but maybe this isn't the way to do it. So maybe that's letting 
employees know about them as an organization, but that's not a funding source. So I think you really have to have that conversation and get good alignment. You know, one of the things I really like along the lines of a trust-based philanthropic engagement that most employees in larger corporations can do is employer match. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful way to start to engage in micro trust-based philanthropy. There's a lot of talk about it in the sector, a lot of talk about it, but ultimately it's like, oh, I believe in trust-based philanthropy, but what are you going to do with the money? Mm Mm-hmm. And and so and it's so complicated because there's a built-in paternalistic tendency with the donor class. They hold power, they hold privilege, and to the grassroots organization that you just spoke about, um, there there is an incredible power dynamic, and it is absolutely intertwined with race, with socioeconomics, with all of that. And so um, I think that. Uh, the closer as donors and as corporations that, that, that anybody can get to trespass philanthropy, you are getting closer to the source. But go only as deep as your tolerance will allow because the other thing you don't want to do, and I've seen this happen, oh, here's a trust-based gift. I give it to you of free will, but somehow there was just basically an unspoken set of expectations mm-hmm. that I just wasn't going to articulate to you because you were just going to have to guess them. Mm-hmm. And now you didn't appease the power of me. You didn't kiss the ring enough, and now the money's not going to continue coming. It's not easy. At the end of the day, we're humans. We tend to hoard and guard resources if left to our own worst demons. And so uh, I, I would say that to anybody in a giving situation, if you are holding power to make a gift, try to in- try to dig and foster as much trust and build that relationship. It is dating. It is dating. I also think really talking to some organizations about who's doing trust-based philanthropy well. Yeah. Um, We have one funder who, it is phenomenal. It is phenomenal in this trust-based space because the entire conversation changes. Mm -hmm. What do you need to be successful? What can we do to help you? How can we bring other people together so that you all can talk to each other and support each other in this work? Um, What happens if you all have a cohort to address an issue? How can we come back and support that? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very different mindset. And when it's done well, everybody... I think the organizations all rise and do more. Um, The work is greater. It's more meaningful. And the feeling about the funder, it's just phenomenal. So get people who are doing it well, like ask for how that's done and what that looks like. You Listen, hey, and you don't have to go any further really than the example you brought up earlier, Regina. Uh, Mackenzie Scott. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Listen, we're just on the Women's History Month has passed, but let's just go ahead and give a shout out Mm -hmm. to this woman coming out of nowhere and modeling the kind of shocking behavior that had a couple of the recipients in this market thinking it was a prank email right. that came to them because the gift was so freely and openly given. Uh, so yeah, let's you know let's foster a little bit less Jeff and more Mackenzie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. And so with that, um, we will wrap it up and. We've talked about organizations funding this this work and what they should be considering and a little bit of advice to the nonprofits in this work as well. So as you think about and reflect over our conversation, what would you say is the one big takeaway you would have for anyone listening to this conversation? If you didn't hear anything else, make sure you heard this. What would you say is really important as we think about this topic? Making sure that the relationships are authentic. I think once you get to that space, you can kind of, you have grace, you have trust, you have all the rest of it. Um, But if you can build those authentic relationships, I think you're in a really good spot. And with that authenticity, know your strength. Know your strength as an organization or as a donor that you can partner with a nonprofit to deliver content, advocacy, programming in a way that is thoughtful, experiential, and uh, 
able to be potentially better executed with an external partner coming into your organization as opposed to solely trying to sort it out inside. I think the beauty of the nonprofit sector is that the expertise that resides in there is available and it is part of that relationship. And I think that when people avail themselves of it, good things come to both companies and nonprofits. And then I would say, I think it is know who you are and make sure you're holding true to your values on both sides. So yes, as a corporation, what are your values and go down that road as an organization what are your values and draw your lines and know that um, in those funding conversations. You got it. All right. Well, ladies, this has been fun. I'm still, I can't let the light up toilet bowl go. I'm really going to have to investigate this, but uh, <laughs> this has been tied in as a donor gift. I don't, I don't think we're going to do that. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what message that says. <laughs> We'll stick to handwritten thank you notes. Yeah, the handwritten thank you notes. I think that's where, wise. where we go Probably for wise. the donor gifts. But I love the fact that you were bringing creativity to the table and how we recognize donors. I love that, that, <laughs> that we all have laughter <laughs> on, we, on the daily. We that's need the it. We thing, need right? it in yeah. this work. We definitely need it. It's hard. Yes. Well, Lauren, Tina, thank you both so much for joining us in the conference room today. It has been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All mine. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Be sure to click that like button. That helps us get our content to more people who would be interested like you. And subscribe. Go ahead. Click it. Click that subscribe button. That makes sure that you get notified every time we post new content. Thank you so much for joining us in the conference room and take care.